Um, I, I want to welcome you to our uh, <clears throat> panel on the humanities and social sciences in higher education. Um, the, uh, typically, we estimate when we think about the careers of our college students that somewhere between 80 and 85 percent of our students will go on for advanced degrees of some sort. Uh, it's probably closer to 85, and, and I suspect that we'll begin to edge up even more. Uh, so uh, the odds are that uh, whatever you do, uh, almost 90 percent of you are going to end up with an advanced degree of some sort. Uh, the question is what field and what time and on what occasion and what circumstances you're going to do that. So that's one fact that's, uh, I think, uh, it can be reassuring or intimidating, but it's, it's, it's there. Uh, the other fact that I think is perhaps more interesting is that we do know that the Chicago's percentage of students who go on for advanced degrees in the form of getting a doctorate, a, 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 an academic doctorate in, in one of the liberal arts, uh, is probably the highest of all of the schools in the Ivy Plus group. That's the Ivy League plus Chicago and Stanford. And um, in general, in, pa in the past, we've tracked somewhere around 14 to 16 percent of our students uh, of each graduating class in the college getting a PhD, which is very high, much higher than, say, uh, certain institutions in the East Coast whose names I won't mention. Um, uh, so that we have not only great majority of our students going on for some advanced degree, but we have a fairly large number of our students who always uh, choose to go on for a PhD. And so that's, uh, in a way, I think that's why you're here today, because at least you have uh, some um, more than passing interest in, in that possibility as a career track. Um, we have a very distinguished panel uh, who's going to, uh, who are going to provide both insights based upon their own experiences and also uh, while they're in school and then subsequent experiences after they left. Uh, the, the higher education, um, the process of getting a degree in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in one of our subjects. Um, and I want to introduce them uh, alphabetically. We have, uh, first of all, Margaret Edsel, who's a, an alum of the class of 1982 from Chicago, uh, who went on to get a master's and PhD in classics from Columbia University, and who's been a, a colleague and uh, worked in Columbia, and she'll explain her career uh, uh, when, when it, her turn comes. Uh, but has a very wide-ranging set of experiences in graduate education, uh, both as a teacher and also as an administrator. Um, we have uh, Crystal uh, Purnell, uh, who's a graduate of a of our Master of the Humanities program, Master of Arts in the Humanities program uh, from 2007, who has gone on to be marketing communications manager for the Hyde Park Arts Center, and she has had a very interesting career in the sense of using a uh, uh, not a PhD, but the, the master's degree as a stepping board to a an important and successful career. I think she can give you some perspective on, on that track, the, the MA track, as it were. And then finally, we're joined by Paul Stanilan, who's also an alum of the college, to 2004, who went on to get a PhD in uh, political science from MIT and is now back in Chicago um, and um, has uh, 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 already a, begun a successful academic career as an assistant professor at Chicago. Um, before I turn it over to uh, Paul, we're going to go in, in, in the order of Paul, Margaret, and then um, Crystal in terms of the presentations. Um, one thing I think it's very important uh, in terms of the uh, uh, to keep in mind as th th all of the information unfolds today about how complex it is and how competitive it is to get into a, uh, uh, a, a graduate program or at least the program that you want, um, I think there is something uh, that you ought to keep in mind, and that is that the, uh, where you're coming from. Um, our students do very well, historically, in graduate programs, uh, gaining admission and gaining fellowships, not only because they're smart and they're hardworking and all the stuff that you've heard about over lunch, but also becoming, because you're coming from this particular institution. Chicago has a reputation that uh, precedes it uh, in um, all the right ways uh, in terms of academic rigor and um, and uh, disciplined uh, uh, training. And uh, again and again, I hear from faculty members who, uh, who have uh, their children in the college. We have a lot of children in the college of, uh, who are children of academics and other institutions. How uh, pleased they are with the kind of training their children are getting in the college because those are the kinds of people they want to be applying to, to their graduate programs. Uh, so that with a reasonably good GPA and, and reasonably good uh, GRE scores, you ought to be able to do fairly well for yourself if you're strategic and if you listen carefully and prepare as to how to do this whole complex process. And so I wouldn't underestimate your potential. Um, and in fact, if anything, I would overestimate your potential a little bit based upon the, the training you've got in Chicago, which is among the best in the nation. Um, finally, uh, we have a new program uh, that's meant to uh, help all of you 
uh, whatever degree level you're aspiring to or whatever uh, your career objectives are. And this is the, our Chicago Careers in Higher Education program. It's one of the eight new Chicago Careers programs um, uh, that we've organized. And this one is targeted to helping get kids into graduate school successfully, hopefully with a fellowship with money. Um, and um, in the, in not only in a graduate school, but in the graduate school of your choice. Uh, and where's Deb? Deb Nibel is uh, right back there. She's the director of the program. She's based over in, um, in um, Adonis Hall. And uh, you should certainly, if you're a third or fourth year student, be in touch with her uh, because we have a whole series of training workshops and uh, information prog programs to give you advice and tailored counsel as to how to uh, be most successful with your graduate applications. So with that, let me now ask uh, Paul Stanland to, to make some remarks. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, John. And hi, everyone. I, I got my BA here, um, or AB, I guess, in 2004. I was a political science major. Uh, I lived in BJ for three years. So I had no idea what I was doing um, through most of my college education. So what I'd like to do is try to offer some both kind of big picture and little picture thoughts on how this all works. Uh, I'm going to focus on the PhD, but also I can talk a little bit about master's programs as well. I'm actually right now on the admissions committee of the graduate admissions committee in the political science department here at UFC. So I'm seeing the other side, the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of files coming in. So I also have some sense of how it works kind of on both ends. Um, I think there are three things I'm going to talk about. The first is, is big picture consideration. Should you go and get a, a higher education degree? Uh, if you're thinking about a doctorate, what are what's the way of going about making the decision? Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the nitty gritty. So if you're going to do it, what's the best way to do it? How do you go about getting le letters of recommendation, writing up a research statement or a statement of purpose, identifying the right schools to apply for, et cetera? And then I'm just going to very briefly offer some thoughts about, from my perspective, from the Graduate Admissions Committee perspective, what are things that jump out as kind of good and uh, not so good, depending <coughs> on the, the particulars? OK, so should you go get a graduate degree? Uh, John Boyer just <laughs> talked about how many of you will go get a graduate degree in some sense. But that includes law school or business school or a whole variety of others. So I'm going to focus here more on the academic side, PhD and master's programs, kind of in higher education with the aim of teaching or of getting academic training um, that is not kind of pre-professional or professional in orientation. This is not an easy decision. Um, there are very few people for whom it is obvious that getting a PhD in Japanese literature or what neuroscience or whatever is obviously the correct choice. So for most of you, it'll be something that's, that's plausible, um, that has some ups and downs, and that requires a lot of serious thought. It's a very rewarding kind of career if, if you kind of successfully get to the end of it, but there's a lot of hard work and contingency and chance and both good and bad luck in between uh, starting off and, and successfully finishing. So you need to weigh those things. It's You will all have a very good shot of getting into a program, but I think the bigger decision is whether you, you want to do that in the first place. Um, on the one hand, this is not a great job market right now for academic jobs. On the other hand, if you get into a good program and you work hard, there are always jobs available that will be really rewarding and that will lead to a kind of intellectual and personal lifestyle that, that's really quite fantastic. I can say, as, as a UFC faculty member, I've been very happy to transition from graduate student to assistant professor. So um, if it works out, it's, it's a really, really wonderful career choice. OK, so how do you go about making that decision in the first place? First, ask around. Talk to as many professors and TAs in the field you're interested in as you can get your hands on. As I was talking to some people over lunch, you should not be afraid of professors. They love to talk about themselves. They love to talk about their opinions and their ideas. So go to office hours. Say, you know, I'm thinking about graduate school. What are your thoughts? What did you do? What are good departments? What are departments maybe I should avoid? What are research activities I should be interested in? All these things, <coughs> professors love to talk, as you've experienced in many interminable lecture halls already. But in this case, you should really take advantage of it. So first of all, just in terms of figuring out, is this something you want to do? And I think people in the business can give you a somewhat clearer sense of the advantages and disadvantages of, of pursuing this. And they may actually surprise you and say, look, you know, this doesn't sound like it's a PhD is really what you want to do. Think about this kind of program or this kind of career. And then let's you know go do some research and let's talk about it in a month or two. So you're going to get a whole range of perspectives. You won't just go in there and have a professor tell you that you only have, you know, you must go to Harvard for, for your degree in a PhD and then go be a professor. You can be surprised by the diversity of responses. So definitely take advantage of that. Um, 
I did. I went straight from college to graduate school, but in retrospect, I think it might have been wise for me to take a year or two off, if possible. Um, gone overseas, got in an actual real world job. I think one thing that there's a risk for college students that they're good at school and they want to continue being in school because they're good at it, right? And so it just seems obvious and natural that you will then go on to get a PhD or a master's because it's school and you know that's how it works. The problem here is that a PhD in particular is not just more school. It's a very different enterprise of creating your own research, often by yourself for long periods of time, maybe depending what field you're in, um, often a foreign country for a year or two, or sitting in a laboratory or alone in a library for hours and days and weeks and months and years. So you really need to think about whether that's something you want to do. And I think you should explore, if, if you're inclined towards doing so, explore some other possibilities. Go join the Peace Corps or get a job as a financial analyst, or be a teacher, or whatever. There are a million interesting things you can do. But it's worth at least thinking about that. If you have any kind of doubt that this is what you want to do, maybe it's worth exploring some other things just to be really sure. Um, if you decide that this is absolutely what, what you want to do after you've thought really hard about it, after you've talked to people, maybe after you've explored other options. So for me, I, I did a Metcalf summer internship. I worked for Mayor Daly, which was fascinating and also persuaded me I did not actually want to go into politics. So if you do things like that and, and you decide that this is kind of the direction you want to go, um, then I think there are a few things to, to think about in terms of putting the best possible application together. As Dean Boyer said, you're going to be extremely competitive from this institution. This is viewed as one of the kind of producers of extremely high-end academic talent. So your file will get a close look. The question then is how can you make the file as strong as possible to get into as many schools as possible with as much money as possible? And basically, to give yourself as many options as you can. There are a couple obvious things. GPA matters. I, I don't really need to say much more about that. It's not that everyone needs a 4.0 or anything like that. But you need to show that in the area that you want to study, you can do high quality work, right? So lots of A's and A minuses are, are very helpful. Depending on the field, there's going to be a lot of variation. So, you know, there's nothing gospel truth here. But all else being equal, better grades are better. GRE scores. Also important, uh, they're really worth studying for. A lot of schools will use them as a kind of triage mechanism. For better or worse, this is just how it works in a lot of places. Where if your scores really just aren't very good, the odds are that you're not going to get a real close look. So it's worth studying for. I'm not very good at math. I'm not great at standardized testing. I force myself, actually the summer I was working for Mayor Daly, to actually like relearn things like algebra and trigonometry and calculus, which thankfully I've never had to use again. Um, but it was it was really worth doing. And so take it seriously. Don't just show up that day. I had friends who did this when I was in college who just thought they were really smart. And maybe they were. They just kind of showed up and took the test and ended up taking the test again because that was a terrible idea. <laughs> so work hard in your classes, get good grades, try to get good GRE scores. This goes without saying. What are some other things that, that are important? Get to know your professors, especially for PhD and master's programs. The letters of recommendation are really, really important because there are hundreds of smart kids from good schools with nice GPAs and good GRE scores. So I'm seeing this right now. You know, there are lots of smart people in the world, but letters of recommendation should make a big difference <laughs> because they put the professor's credibility on the line. They say, this is a student I know. This is a student I respect. This is a student who can do high quality research. So you want those letters. Go talk to your professors at office hours. Volunteer to research for them. Just make yourself known. Professors, as I said earlier, like to talk, especially about themselves. And so if you want to do something like this, it's really worth putting in the FaceTime, not in like an obsequious kind of way. You don't want to be showing up every week with you know, questions that are about nothing, just put in FaceTime. But you do want to show serious engagement so that you can get a, a good letter of recommendation. Um, Depending what field you're looking at, it's well worth trying to pursue some research opportunities. I've got like five undergraduate research assistants right now who just showed up and were interested in working on something. And I was happy to say, yeah, you know, go find out about this part of Pakistan for me or whatever. Professors are often very interested in free labor, which in a sense is uh, potentially problematic, but for you guys is great because it means you could get actual research experience. And that not only goes into the letter of recommendation they could write, but it's also a credible signal to grad schools that you're serious. You're actually willing to put in the time to do the kind of work that you're going to do in a PhD or, or, or a high-level master's program. So these are things that maybe aren't as obvious as grades and GREs, but they're enormously important. So it's worth putting in the time and thinking hard about them. Something else, get started working on your statement of purpose early. Uh, so there, 
will be some kind of statement that you're told, you know, what do you want to do here? Why do you want to be here? What is it that, that is special and distinctive about you? And these matter a lot as well, because there are lots of people with good GREs, good grades, good letters of recommendation, and maybe some research experience, right? So once you get through all that, then it's, you think, well, what does this statement say? What is this person's actual intellectual interest? So go talk to the people at CAPS. Go talk to your professors. Go talk to your TAs, who often have been this, through this process recently. Ask them to read it. Some of them probably won't, or they say they will and they won't, and whatever. But you will find some people who are genuinely interested and willing to put in the time. Work very hard on that. and Make clear that you have some kind of coherent intellectual package. You don't want to say that you have a particular project in mind, because nobody will believe you. Many people come to graduate school with some clear idea of what they want to work on, and two weeks later, it disappears. Instead, what you want is kind of a package of interests, an intellectual profile that will um, let, let you kind of stand out, show that you have some core set of research interests, some kind of intellectual personality that is valuable for the, the, the department that you're applying for. So work hard on that, talk to your professors, and then do the obvious stuff with grades and GREs. Um, very briefly, I think I'm approaching 10 minutes now. On the flip side, I've been on the admissions committee. I just looked at 80-something files yesterday. A couple things jump out at me uh, that are closely related to what I was just talking about. Often people don't put any time or any discernible time into their statement of purpose. It reads like an extended essay on their thoughts about the world or some kind of extended biography, which isn't, you know, it's often it's clear these people threw this together without a whole lot of thought. So approach it like an actual research or a term paper where you need a thesis sentence. This is who I am. This is what I want to do. These are three things that I want to work on, for instance, at least in political science. As opposed to, you know, I was born in Indiana, then I once saw corn, and I thought, boy, that's interesting. Maybe that's something to do with agriculture. And, you know, there's, there are a lot of bad ways to write a research statement. So make sure you get advice and feedback. Um, also apply to programs that make sense to you. We get people who have no discernible clear link to what our department kind of specializes in. So do a lot of research on these departments. You know, in political science, if there's a department that's really strong on American politics and has nobody who studies the rest of the world, and you want to study the rest of the world, well, don't apply there. That's a waste of a hundred dollars application fee, right? So do your homework ahead of time. Don't just apply to Harvard because it's Harvard or Cornell because you've heard of Cornell. Especially at the graduate level, departments are often highly specialized, and so you're going to find schools that you would think aren't that great that are actually top 10, and vice versa. So this also comes back to talking to people a lot. Um, I wouldn't pay too much attention to the internet, but sometimes you can find some useful things on there. So I'll just leave it at that. That's kind of a mix of high and, and low level considerations, and I'll be happy to take questions before or during the session or afterwards. Hi, I'm Margaret Edsel, and I graduated in 1982 from the college. And it was interesting because I, t I talked, I was kind of afraid of my teachers when I was in school. So when I came into school, I, my advisor had told me I should be a pre-med major, uh, not a classics major, because I didn't do very well on the Latin test, apparently, that they gave us the first week of school. But I had come from this background where I wanted to be a writer, a poet, um, and I, my father had been a doctor, and I'd seen firsthand what it was like, and I knew I didn't want to be a doctor, even though apparently it was in my genes. Um, so I, I decided that the best thing to do if you wanted to be a writer was to study classics, um, because I felt that if I could read Homer and Plato and Horace and Virgil, I would, I would be able to write better. So you can see from the beginning of my talk uh, that I was somewhat impractical in all of my decision making, including only applying to the University of Chicago because I knew it was the right school for me. Fortunately, I got in. Uh, so uh, similarly, I went through the classics pro program, which I adored. I mean, I thought um, all of the, cl the curriculum was set up in such a way to cover everybody that I wanted to cover. I felt I needed to know. Uh, the teachers, I, w I must admit, I was a little afraid of the teachers, although some of them were very nice to me while I was in school. And then um, just about the last two months I was in school, I realized that I hadn't learned quite enough Latin or Greek for my taste. And I decided that I would go to graduate school. So of course, I talked to my teachers. One of them, who is still in the classics department, said, you should not go to graduate school. There are no jobs in classics. They're closing down programs. You should go to law school. Because his wife had just gotten a PhD in classics. And I, I believe she went to law school. So I think he thought that was the solution to the <coughs> PhD in classics. Uh, uh, idea. Um, and then I spoke to another professor, I think, who's still here. 
And I said, uh, I'm thinking about going to graduate school. And he said, oh, where are you thinking about going? And I said, I think Columbia, because you know I had done a similar thing in applying to graduate schools. I decided Columbia was the school for me. Um, and he said, well, I don't think you should go to Columbia because uh, it isn't very good. And I said, oh, really, where, where do you think I should go? And he said, you should come to the University of Chicago for graduate school. And I said, well, why would, why would you say that? I mean, what is it about Chicago that makes it better than Columbia? And he said, I'm here. Okay, so, <laughs> anyway, so I, I fortunately, I took a year off because I decided I needed to really be able to read German very well to go to graduate school. And of course, I left school during a very bad economic turndown. So it was very difficult to find any kind of work in New York City that you could support yourself with. But I had this idea that I'm not going to go to graduate school unless I can support myself somehow. And at that time, there was no full funding. Um, there was very little funding, in fact. There was all partial bits of funding. But I could also go to the, another reason that made Columbia very attractive to me, other than the wonderful classics department that's actually very well ranked, um, is that my father was in the medical school, so I could get free tuition there. Anyway, so when I went, uh, went off to Columbia, um, I found that I, I only applied to Columbia, and guess, guess, guess what? I got in. I was very lucky, okay? So, Again, I would say, if you're interested in going to graduate school, don't do what I did. I would apply to a range of schools. I learned that there, now that I know a lot about uh, different academic departments and programs, I recognize that there are now 12 graduate programs in classics I would have been perfectly happy going to. They had many similarities and funding. Um, but uh, I guess I got seemed to get very limited advice and, and, and take very little uh, of the good advice, like going to law school. Anyway. Um, when I got it, when, while I was going through the PhD program at, at Columbia, I decided I didn't really like it very much. I said I liked Chicago better, so I was going to go back to Chicago. So I applied to Chicago. I was lucky I got in, um, but there was not funding, and I decided I couldn't really afford to support myself because I decided I was not going to go into debt. Even with free tuition, I felt I couldn't pay my rent, buy my very expensive books, classical texts, and dictionaries, etc. So I took some time off from school because um, I just felt it was something that was not going to be financially feasible for me. And during that time, I, I had always been interested in the arts, and I, thought, I kind of thought I'd get into arts administration, working in a gallery, uh, representing artists and things like that. So I, I worked at the Whitney Museum very happily for, for two years, and I read a lot of theory, and I read a lot of Greek and Latin, and then I started to long for graduate school again. And when I reapplied, lo and behold, they'd instituted some funding for graduate students, not for everybody, but for some people. Um, and I was fortunate enough to get a five-year fellowship uh, to go to Columbia, which was actually more money than I was making at the time at the Whitney Museum. So of course, again, in a very poor economic climate, it appealed to me to go back to do what I wanted to do um, with the funding and support of, uh, of, of the, the graduate program. And so I, I happily <laughs> went through my program. I loved writing my dissertation. I did notice that there were some disagreements among the faculty and that things weren't always very smooth in academia and that it wasn't this uh, beautiful uh, experience that where you, you, know, you could just enjoy the life of the mind without the harsh realities of you know, interpersonal uh, issues and things like that. Um, but when I got out of graduate school, again, there was another, 1995, there was an economic turndown. And they were shutting down classics programs. And I was fortunate in that I got some in interviews at some fairly good schools with nice classics departments. But unfortunately, my husband, who is also a University of Chicago alum and had just gotten a PhD in biostatistics, was being snapped up by the biostatistics department at Columbia. So I had to make a decision. Am I going to go to Vermont and freeze and teach four and four, you know, four, <laughs> four and four at 28,000? They were serious. Um, or am I going to think of something else to do with my PhD? And I had always, uh, because I had always had to make money in graduate school, I'd had a lot of jobs around Columbia University. I'd run the in vitro fertilization unit right after I passed my comps. So I, you know, I had run things. I knew how the university worked. Whenever there were there, there was a, a doctor up at the medical center who needed somebody to help them set up their practice and navigate through the system. I was always hired to do this for a brief period of time, which enhanced my uh, financial uh, situation always. 
Um, so I decided, you know, I was always interested in the graduate school. I, was, I didn't feel like they'd given the best support to the graduate students, and I thought, well, I'd be interested in working in the graduate school or in upper administration because I always tried to make things work when I had these other jobs, and I could see uniting that with what, what I did did in my graduate program, like, you know, making things work, right? So I applied for th three jobs, and um, three jobs, one at Columbia, one at NYU, and I believe one at Fordham. And uh, I got the job at Columbia, and the job was assistant to the dean of the graduate school. And I, I thought, well, this looks very interesting to me. I was more interested at the time in the undergraduate program, but I thought, well, the graduate program looks interesting. And I did something very tricky. I, I wrote up a, 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 a CV that said, Margaret Etzel, PhD, right? I didn't say classics, because I had this idea that people who weren't classicists weren't going to be very excited about that, and I might not get the interview. And also, the previous dean had been in the classics department, and I knew for a fact that the dean of the graduate school and he did not get along. So when I got into the interview, um, I actually got hired because in some of the work I had done to make extra money was to manage grants, apply for grants up at the medical center. So he wanted somebody who, A, could write grants and get money, which I had done, two, could write well, which I could do, and three, get along with other people. Now, it was more difficult to prove that to him, but somehow I persuaded him, and he became a great mentor. I mean, uh, I, he basically farmed off his work to me, <laughs> and uh, I was ghostwriting, you know, his letters to the alums. I was writing proposals. I was writing letters to, you know, the, the faculty and uh, doing research on um, mentoring graduate students, TA training and things along that lines. He made, he made me write a TA manual, have teaching workshops for the graduate students. And I did this for a while, and I, I kind of um, I got tired of it. We switched over uh, to another dean. He went off. Uh, to be the founding dean at the Division of Biological Sciences at UCSD. And um, I thought, yeah, I, I, w I felt hurt that he didn't take me with him, but then I, I worked for a new dean. And what happened was I worked very closely with the chairs of the academic department, so when one of them became the vice president of arts and sciences, he hired me to take on the same role, basically, with faculty. Um, so what I can say about my experience is... Um, you never know, you know, you, you can kind of, in some ways, you really have to take advantage of the kinds of unusual opportunities that pop up, because it never dawned on me that if I got this job working as the assistant to the dean and being his lackey for several years, I didn't realize I would learn so much. By the time I left the graduate school, I was the associate dean of the PhD programs, and that opened up this other job for me, and I get job offers quite a bit to do what I do. And I stay at Columbia for now because I've agreed with my boss that I'll stay at Columbia until he's done being the vice president. But, um, you know, I would never believe anybody now who told me uh, to go to law school because getting a PhD in classics uh, is not a good idea. You know, I think that you should really, I kind of followed my dream the whole way and it's paid off. So that's my story. Thank you, Margaret. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Crystal, and as uh, Dean Boyer mentioned before, I, I sort of have a different um, landing pad <laughs> than, than everyone else on the panel. So I wanted to kind of talk about a little bit about my my past, of course, um, but then how I came to be in the position that I'm in now and how that was affected by my graduate studies at the university. Um, I attended undergraduate at the University of Missouri in Columbia, in Columbia Missouri. And I studied English. Uh, I had emphasis in creative writing and a uh, minor in black studies. And, and so I, I really had it in my mind, similarly, that I was going to be a poet. I was going to do slam poetry and live dangerously uh, in New York. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but as you can see, that, that didn't really pan out. Um, <laughs> what happened is that I, I was in school, and we had a, a class called Capstone, which was essentially the last class you take as a senior. And in that class, the dean, I had a wonderful dean, uh, Bill Dawson. He came in and talked to our class about um, where, our f where our futures could go and what we could do uh, after leaving graduate school. And the very first thing he said, uh, he sat us all down and said, you will not be an academic. There are no jobs. You will not be successful in it. 
because everyone else in this room will be applying for the same jobs that you're applying to. There's just not enough to go around. And I was like, oh, well, that's nice. <laughs> um, <laughs> but luckily for me, the things I liked about my degree were the writing, the communication aspects. And so I was like, well, that's fine. It's Academics didn't really seem like a have to for me. Um, so I kind of thought more about where I wanted to go, and I was kind of thinking about um, going to graduate school. And the GREs were coming up. Um, I had a father who sort of brought himself up by his own bootstraps. And so instead of uh, paying for me to take a GRE class, he said, whatever you can learn in that GRE book, you can learn in the books of the library. So let's go do that. And I was like, awesome. Uh, <laughs> so I didn't take the GRE class. And I went in to take the GRE. And I was so anxious about it. Um, and I don't know how much you guys know about the GRE, but at least when I took it, um, the mathematics portion uh, is, is set up so that as you miss questions, the questions get easier. Uh, and sort of to compensate for people who may not know certain things or may, ha may be having trouble with the test. Uh, so I start out taking the test, and they're asking me, you know, trade questions and calculus. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like answering everything. And then I get to questions where, like, if Susie has four apples and Johnny has three. And I'm just like, wow. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm really messing up. Um, and after the test, I just kind of shut down for two days. I didn't leave my room. I had this huge panic attack. I thought my future was done. Um, so what I decided to do is take a couple years off. Uh, I, I decided to get a job. I wanted to get some real world, real world experience before I continue on to graduate school. And it's honestly one of the best decisions I made. Um, I think by the time I was, I was graduating from undergraduate, I really didn't have a sense of what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to work with people. I knew I wanted to work with language. But that could have been anything. I, I interned in publishing. I interned in radio. I you know, had a lot of different experiences. And it wasn't really pointing me in a direction that I knew that this is where I wanted to go. Um, so I ended up working in career services at a college called Robert Morris College. It's right down, downtown on State and Van Buren. And I worked there for two years. And I would assist students uh, in working on their resumes and doing cover letters and doing practice interviews and all those sorts of things. And I really noticed that there was a sort of lack of instruction in a lot of Chicago public schools. Um, and there was, there was a lack of people who were interested in really bringing up the, the, the people who had the least. Um, that's when I kind of decided, man, this is a problem I really want to address. Uh, there's not enough People who have a high interest in improving society, there's not enough money going into the nonprofit sector. This is something I really want to do. And of course, I learned later the thousands and thousands of those people, but that's, that's nothing. Uh, so I decided to go back to graduate school. And when I was looking at programs, I knew I, I wanted to stay in Chicago. Uh, my family was at the time living in Naperville. They've since left me for Florida. Um, but I was, I was definitely looking for something that was in Chicago and something that would allow me to use my background in literature and things that I was interested in, particularly African American studies, and would allow me to advance my, my thoughts in those directions. Um, and I kind of shopped around. I went to, uh, college websites and kind of looked at what classes were they offering, what, who was teaching there, um, what sort of things were they getting known for. Um, and I, you know, looked at DePaul, Northwestern, Loyola, and I came to the University of Chicago website and I found the math program. Uh, and I started doing research on it and uh, learning that, you know, I would be able to pick from a variety of classes. And I was looking at some of the, the classes on race studies and things that were seemed really interesting to me. And a lot of people who I thought, man, it would be great to kind of study under this person. Um, but then I remembered that experience I had with that GRE test and just how bad it was. Um, so I decided that, okay, I'm going to take some of the anxiety out of it. And I'm only going to, only going to apply to one school. And I'm really going to put my focus in this application. I'm just going to get it done. And I probably won't get in, but at least I'll have one out of the way. And so it won't be so bad the next time I, I go to apply for grad school. And, and next year, I'll apply again, and I'll get into you know whatever school I wanted. Um, so it happens I, I got in. <laughs> I wasn't expecting it. I had saved no money. Um, I was totally unprepared to, to, to get into graduate school, but I, I kind of felt like you know, I was given this opportunity, this fluke of, of history happened, and I actually got into to a really great graduate program, so I kind of have to go. Um, so what I did is I decided to take out some loans and suck it up and, and just go and, and do it. And I, I really don't regret that decision. The, the things I learned at the university have become so important to who I am, not only as a professional, but also as a person. 
Um, and so I really enjoyed the opportunity to study at the university uh, with people who are at the forefront of uh, the things that I was wanting to think about. Um, the classes I took, my, my thesis focused on cultural studies, writing, and politics, and so I was able to take classes in the Harris School as well as classes in uh, political study, uh, political sciences. Um, Gooding, uh, I don't know if any of you know Professor Gooding Weems, but he was my thesis advisor. Uh, so I really got to meet a lot of really great people. Um, but then I also had the university's math program has a huge support network built into the program. So I had several different advisors who were there. Uh, so I can go to on a weekly basis and say either, you know, I need help picking classes or just, you know, everything is terrible right now. I just need, I just need a hug. Um, and really helped you through and, and helped you, helped you think about finishing, um, and really kind of shaping your, your thoughts about what you're working on. And really, what they said in the, uh, in the address over lunch is true. The university really does focus on helping you think, uh, about how to talk about a problem or an answer or an issue. And what that did is helped uh, me enter into a conversation about the things that I was interested in. So it's not necessarily, I didn't go into my degree thinking that I was going to write this thesis and then I was going to get it published and then I was going to get a job at a college. I really went into it thinking, I'm going to write this thesis and it's going to help me think about the things that I care about. And from there, I'm going to help, it's going to help me kind of decide what I want to do with my life. Um, and it turned out what I wanted to do was kind of work in community affairs and public affairs. Uh, so from graduating from the university, I, I deliberately told myself I was going to do a, a three-month internship unpaid, which when you come out of a university setting and you pay a few thousand dollars for, <laughs> for a degree you just got, saying that you're going to work unpaid for three months is like a, a, a big, scary thing to do. Um, but I did it. I, you know, paid rent. I, you know, got another job where I was making ten dollars an hour, and I, I survived it. And I worked in Senator Durbin's office, which gave me a, a huge amount of contacts. And plus, it just looks really nice on your resume to say I worked in the senator's office. Um, from there, I ran a campaign for about six months, and that's where I realized I don't want to go into <laughs> politics. <laughs> um, but then, of course, my my candidate lost, um, and it's kind of like, okay, I just paid a lot of money to get this degree. I have no job. Everything I had planned is not working out. What now? Um, so I really thought about what was it that I enjoyed about um, my studies? What was it I enjoyed doing? And I decided um, that I still wanted to cont continue on in this public affairs, public relations aspect. Uh, so from there, I took a paid internship at Edelman Public Relations, which is one of the top public relations firms in, in the country. Um, I was there for about five months, and I learned so much. And Really what I learned was how to take all the, all those things that I, um, learned at the university, all the things I thought I was good at and how to apply them in a practical setting. So I knew I was a good writer. I knew I was good at communications. I knew I was good at analytical thinking. I knew I, I knew a lot about politics. The university had taught me all of that. But then how do I relate that to a client? How does that work, uh, in a business setting? What, what of those skills are really useful? Um, and it sort of helped me pick out what about I, what about what I do is what I enjoy. Um, and it got to the point where I was looking for a full-time job. I was offered um, the position at the High Park Art Center, which I actually found via the university alumni listserv. So that was an immensely helpful thing for me to have as a resource. Um, and then I was also, at the same time, offered a position at Edelman, uh, an entry-level position, where I'd actually, they liked me so much they were going to pay me higher than what the entry-level person would have gotten. But at the same time, I had this decision to make. And this is one of the things that I think we were talking about over lunch is at a certain point, you have to make a decision, particularly those of us who are interested in, in humanities and social services. Do I want to make money or do I want to feel really, really good about what I do? And I decided to feel really, really good about what I do. And I went to the art center. Um, and this is a place where I have to say I use a lot of my degree. Um, one of the classes I took at the university was an academic and professional writing course. That comes up all the time in what I do. I do marketing and public relations, which is essentially managing the public face of the organization. Um, so all of those cultural studies, all those um, writing classes, all of those thinking about politics and how people interact with each other and really uh, taking an idea to its furthest point all of those attributes that I learned at the university came into play in my job. Um, and it's not an academic field. And so I, I felt really great about that in that I don't feel like I wasted my time or my money, which is always nice. Uh, <laughs> but feeling good to, to, feeling good about knowing that I learned a skill set that is important in my, in my career. 
And it wasn't necessarily me having to adjust my career to fit what I learned. It was the other way around. Um, so really that was my key learning in graduate school was trying to, to pick apart um, what skills graduate school was giving me, like the, the anal analytical skills, the writing skills, what skills were going to be necessary in my profession when I actually got into my profession and hence taking all the additional internships after uh, graduate school. Um, and really developing a whole, um, a holistic sort of view about what I wanted my career to be. Uh, of course, my career isn't over. I'm, you know, gonna go on to, to other things. And so I, that's a continual process for me is kind of picking apart what did I learn at the university? What I, what, it, how does it apply to what I'm doing now? How, how do I sort of advance on all of these skills and building those contexts? So using the people I met at the university, using the people I, I I'm meeting in my career and kind of building, um, a well-rounded idea of who I am as a professional. Um, and I think graduate school and my professional experience has been immensely uh, important in that aspect. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Uh, I think we have about about 20 minutes for questions. Let me just uh, um, come in on a couple things that um, several of, of my colleagues have said. Uh, uh, the, the one uh, uh, one thing that, that uh, Margaret mentioned that uh, I think it was she who mentioned it is the the current funding structure now as opposed to what it was like back in the old days. Um, most of the PhD programs now will pay you uh, to go to graduate school for five years. Uh, they'll give you a tuition stipend, uh, so basically wave tuition, and they'll give you money to live on. Um, and this is a kind of the five year package. And many places will actually provide summer support as well. Uh, most graduate degrees take more than five years, and, and many of the departments then have supplemental funding that can help you uh, with years six and seven. So that the uh, the uh, this is a, actually a good thing, uh, um, and uh, people are not having to go hundreds of thousands of dollars into debt to get PhDs. The the, the consequence of this is the number of slots has been diminished because the uh, programs are, are no longer kind of open to people who will pay. So that's one. Th you can make it in. They should pay you, so it's different than going to college where you pay, you pay us, okay, uh, or, or many of you pay us. Uh, the uh, graduate school they should pay you. Now the master's program is a little different, but but and uh, if you're if you're good and dedicated and do all the things that everybody's already told you, you should be able to net, uh, snag one of these um, one of these packages. Uh, the second thing is uh, uh, <laughs> something that uh, uh, Paul alluded to, and that is the. Um, uh, the, the, the quality of departments, uh, and, and also the, the narcissism of faculty. I mean, let's, let's put it on. We're all narcissists, right? But everybody in this room is a narcissist. It's part of being a human being. Uh, but, but academics are particularly narcissistic. Um, and, uh, they all want that big, thick fest shrift at the end of their career, right? So that they, they want graduate students who will become famous and then write famous articles that they will honor them. Um, uh, it's very important, if, at least in the field of history, which I'm in, and I think many of the other social science and so, so, soft social science and humanities disciplines, um, to make some contact with prospective faculty before you apply. Uh, this can either be in person or it can be by telephone or by email. Uh, faculty love to talk, of, as Paul said, they love to talk about themselves and they love to have strangers contact them and say admiring <laughs> things to them in the email. Um, um, and, and, and part of it's a game and, and, you know, you have to learn to play the game, but part of it's also serious. That if, if you can actually do some research and find out that there are five graduate schools or six or 12 or whatever, we actually would like to study uh, the field of uh, American history or, or South, a South Asian politics or uh, 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 classical studies. Uh, uh, why not contact some of the faculty, express your interest? Because they, they actually will remember this when they begin to read the applications. And, you know, well, yeah, somebody, yeah, that person called me. I, I do remember that. And so that there, there's part of the strategy, and, and, and Deb's, Deb's uh, 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 program in, in, in higher education that will actually give you more information as to how, how to do this. Finally, I, I think the uh, something which uh, ought to be, for, for most of us who get into this, um, this business, uh, you're getting into research and, and, and you have to, you're, you're not, you're not going to get into graduate school with a fellowship unless you can prove you can do research of a high quality. You're going to end, end up doing a lot, spending a lot of your life teaching though. And so, uh, part of being an academic is to be a teacher. If, if you don't like teaching, you're probably in the wrong business unless you want to get an econ PhD and work <laughs> in a bank. And that's fine. I mean, that's a noble thing to do. Uh, uh, and, and we have a lot of our grads who have econ PhDs who work in investment banks. And, Thank, thank God. They're all very generous, and that's great. Um, and uh, and I, I meet a lot of them. I shake a lot of hands. Uh, but but 
uh, for most of the rest of us in the humanities, social sciences, even in the physical sciences, you're going to spend a lot of time teaching. And if you think you'd like to be a teacher, whether it's a, on the college level or not, uh, then that's another reason to, in terms of, in terms of in, your, in, your self inventory, do I really want to go ahead with this? Uh, it's, it, it, and I think as Paul says, it's an enormously satisfying profession. It's not the most highly compensated. But at the end of the day, I, I, I know a lot more happy academics than I know happy, and I'm not going to mention the, what the other professions, uh, <laughs> lest we begin to become invidious here. But it is a very <laughs> fulfilling way to live your life and to do important things, but if you like being a teacher, and, and that's part of it. Okay, so let's open it up for questions. I hope you, uh, as all of us have, uh, have talked, there have been some, some uh, questions. There's no, um, there's no silly question or stupid question. They're just questions. So why don't we begin? Who would like to ask a question? There, here we go. Okay, uh, I actually have a microphone, but just uh, two requests from us before you do start. If you have a question directed towards a particular person on the panel, please say who your question is directed to so that particular person can answer your question first and then everyone else can weigh in. Um, and secondly is after you finish your question, please pass it back to me so I can get it to the next questioner as soon as possible. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Aaron Talley. Um, I just was wondering if you all could maybe speak a little bit more about um, whenever you do your research or whatever projects that you're working on, how you actually make it um, relevant and trickle down outside of the upper echelon of academia, because that's an issue I'm, I feel like I'm having, because even though I want to pursue like graduate studies, I might want to go the more humanities side, not necessarily the social science side. And I feel like that becomes difficult um, in making sure that you're, you know, creating things that people can actually use on a practical level. So I guess just more thoughts about how to make your work relevant and make sure that you know, you're really um, at just accessing a broader community than just academia. Anybody want to take a stab at that? So, uh, so I, I'm on the, the social <laughs> side, so I don't know about humanities, but I, I study uh, insurgency and ethnic conflict in India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Afghanistan. So, you know, I guess, unfortunately for the world, but fortunately for me, uh, that has become kind of a growth area where I can write op-eds or publish in foreign policy journals and, you know, educate people about it in a way that I hope is relevant. Um, I occasionally talk to people from the government or newspapers or whatever. So, you know, at least in political science, there are ways of doing it. There are also some pretty strong academic incentives not to, but at a lot of places, if you're willing to kind of you know, put yourself out there that it can be extremely rewarding to have some kind of outside presence beyond just the ivory tower. Um, I would suggest that you not go into ancient studies, okay? <laughs> but once I've said that, I can say that there are many fields in which the work, uh, the publications of faculty hit the New York Times bestseller list and become relevant. Uh, so I would look to fields like history where you get, you know, what we have right now at Columbia is we're act actively trying to recruit public intellectuals, people with PhDs whose books reach a broader audience. And I would look to history, English, um, art, and if you're in interested in the humanities, but certainly the social sciences are a given. Um, but I would not assume because it's academic, it's not relevant to the broader world. Um, and I can say from, from my standpoint, I'm kind of looking at it from the other side. Like what, what can the academic community do for me? And I, I honestly, uh, use academic studies all the time. Um, it's something that I always like to, to keep, um, sort of in my periphery because in my line of work, what I'm always looking for is content. Um, it's one thing for me to say something, but it's so much better to have someone else be, um, an advocate for a, a, a message I'm trying to get out. Um, so I'm always looking for papers, studies, things that help me understand. Uh, we have a, a school and studio at the Art Center, so something that can under, help me understand how art influences, you know, a child's performance in, in school. Things like that are immensely important for me. Um, at other places, when we we're, you know, at Edelman, we would do things like, you know, hire a, a professor, an academic, to be a spokesperson or someone who can speak to an issue where me as the marketing person, it doesn't sound as nice as someone who studies the, the issue in the field. Um, so there's a lot of ways that I sort of uh, interact with academia and kind of pick out pieces that can be influential and helpful in my career. Okay. So for many of my professors, I've actually heard that 
going into a social sciences PhD program isn't worthwhile unless it's a top 10 or top 20 or, I don't know, top and numbered program. Is that really true? Um, I, I guess the, um, um, well, that comes back to the whole issue of rankings, okay? Uh, and, and we, we are, uh, and as Americans, and certainly as members of, of this community, our fi all of our fingerprints are on this one, because we all love them, right? We, uh, we love to hate them, and then when we go up in the rankings, we love to love them. Um, um, I, I guess I would say that, um, there has been, uh, there's still a, not an old boy, uh, an old girl, old girl network so much as a kind of an old, uh, venerable university network. And certainly, um, it's, is it better to have a PhD from Stanford, Chicago, or Harvard as opposed to a, a, a PhD from Louisiana State or from University of Kansas? Not to, to pick invidiously, but just to give you examples. Sure. And, um, um, and for all kinds of reasons. On the other hand, uh, I edited a journal uh, called the Journal of Modern History, which is a very big uh, a journal in the field of modern history. And I'm really surprised at the, uh, when bo bo books are published, I'm surprised, and you open up and read the preface of where they went to graduate school. There has been, at least in history and in some of the other um, uh, more humanistic social sciences, a process of what I could only call, only call democratization with a small d. Uh, I find people publishing very good books now who are trained at the University of Kansas and trained at LSU on the graduate level. Um, and so that the, um, I, I think that uh, the quality of the faculty is probably what you want to pay more attention to than the quality of the, um, of, of the program because it, there are some fields, uh, just to say American history, the University of Virginia, which is not a top 10 department in most fields, but in American history, it's certainly a, very much a top 10 department. Um, if you want to do, um, uh, if, if I'm kind of get, got my facts straight, the University of Florida at Gainesville has enormously successful programs in, in obviously in Latin American studies, but also in um, uh, Latin American archaeology, as does the University of Arizona. And if you wanted to do archaeology, you probably would go to Arizona or Gainesville more than Harvard, Yale, Princeton, uh, because so that those programs are also uh, based upon the quality of individual faculty members, not just on the U.S. news ranking. So I, I think I think that you, you ought to keep, and, and that creates a bigger, as it were, fishing pond uh, to begin to, to, to think about uh, these issues. And I, I think, and I have to say that this is kind of hard because as a dean, we oftentimes will encounter faculty who will say, you know, I just got an offer from X and so forth. Uh, and you say, like, you got an offer from where? Um, um, what is you know? Wh why should we pay attention to X? But in fact, that's a, that's kind of arrogant, and, and, and I've learned that that's the wrong way. There's actually a lot of good, a lot of good schools out there, and, 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 with, and with your coming from Chicago, you have a real good opportunity to to, to be successful. So, um, I, I have two minds here. One is to agree with what the dean just said, and I think that's absolutely right. In political science, at least, there are places like the University of Rochester, which is a very good university, but has a really excellent political science department for particular types of work. You can get a job at Harvard coming out of Rochester if you're really good at, say, game theory. I will say, though, it, it does get much harder as you move outside of either kind of general top 15 departments or niche departments, places like Rochester. There aren't that many jobs. There are not that many jobs that are kind of good teaching load, lots of research money, good undergraduates, good graduate students. And so... If you're going to go to a place that either isn't kind of a top general department or a top specialty department, it's very important to calibrate expectations. Um, and this is just the way it is, at least in poli sci. It's very hard to get a really good job below a certain, coming out of a department below a certain point. It happens. It's doable. But in a lot of cases, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it if your hope is to end up as, to, you know, a full professor at Princeton or something. So I think this is where research and talking to professors becomes absolutely essential because they're going to know what the UVAs or Gainesvilles are. And they're also going to know the places that if you go to, you're never going to come out or you're not going to come out with a job that you necessarily think you're going to get coming in. So talk to your professors a lot. Yes, question over here. This is like a church service. Work. <laughs> We're not Hi. asking for money, though, so that's okay. Um, my name is Caroline. I don't know if any of you know about this, um, but my question is about applying to graduate school at international universities, um, so universities specifically in Europe. Um, and what if the process is different? I don't. I imagine that 
like there are tests that you might take that are different from the GRE as well as foreign language exams. Um, and also what it's like to have a university from a European university coming back and doing academic work in the United States. I'll take a, a quick first cut at this. Uh, I think the application procedure tends to be pretty different, um, though my understanding is the GRE is often maybe is used overseas. I don't know. I know the British system to some extent, and it's a whole different ball game, right? There, the PhD program is often just three or four years. You don't necessarily take kind of coursework for the first two years the way you do here. The idea is basically you show up, you take a couple seminars, and then you write a dissertation. So it's a very different kind of, of structure. Um, there is variation across European universities, um, but they're often very, very different than the American system. In terms of coming back to the U.S. academia, again, I can only really speak to political science. I would say it's, it's quite difficult to get a PhD to a place like Oxford or Cambridge and then come back and get a job at a top 50 university. The training system is just very different. There's a very different set of emphases uh, between the two systems. So it can be a very valuable, worthwhile educational experience. But if you want to kind of get into academia back in the States, at least in poli sci, it's, it's quite difficult to pick. Margaret, do you have a? Yeah, um I think that it depends on the field, because I think some fields kind of lend themselves to a more international exchange. So, for example, people that were undergraduates when I was a graduate um, in classics went to Oxford and Cambridge, and those are considered to be very good degrees, and they, they've come back and they've gotten jobs in the United States. You see a fair amount of that. I imagine the same is true in history. Yeah, it's it's also true in philosophy uh, and in some of the uh, yeah. langu language and lit departments. Correct. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that uh, Paul is right, though. The training system is rather different. I, 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 and, yeah. uh, basically, if you go to the London School of Economics or, or, or you know, University College London or Cambridge or Oxford for a PhD, they basically give you a library card. Yeah. And um, they say, uh, okay, <laughs> hey, kid, kid, here's your library card. Um, and you may have a seminar or something like that, but then, um, so you're kind of on your own and you're expected to finish really within about four years, three to four years. So it's a faster PhD. I have had students, advisees in our college, kids who have worked with me on their BA papers who have actually applied to go to, into the British system and have gotten the degrees and ended up getting jobs, but all the jobs they've gotten have been in Europe and in the UK. So they basically made a decision to kind of live, uh, have a professional career in, um, in the UK. And it's a big enough system and it's open to talent and so they've done, they, they've done very well. But it is, I think Paul is right, it's, it is difficult to come back, except, uh, in, especially in the social sciences and in the, in the humanities, uh, fields where, which are, uh, perhaps a little more, um, uh, more like the British system in the sense of the training. Um, it's more plausible. So I, th I think the answer to the question is, you know, what, what field are you thinking of and then what's European university? In, in, um, in the, uh, in, in, once you go abroad into the uh, British, uh, into the German and French system, it's it's, it's even more complicated. Yeah. Uh, here's another expert over here. In terms of uh, kind of fundamental coursework and so forth. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Yes, please. And then there's one down here. All right. Thank you. And I have a bit of a cold, so just bear with me. Um, my question is mainly directed to uh, Margaret. I'm a classics major. Um, I really enjoy <clears throat> the discipline, um, and I'm thinking about perhaps. Um, pursuing, you know, graduate studies in it. My question would be, do you think, uh, as someone who doesn't necessarily want to stay in academia and teaching, do you think a master's or a PhD program would be better suited to um, someone who, you know, wants to learn about the discipline, gain general knowledge, and then perhaps transition into a, a non-academic career? Do you think, uh, you know, graduate or uh, master's or PhD would be better? Um, yeah, classics is tricky, okay? Um, and there have been real ebbs and flow in the market. So right now there aren't many jobs. I have a lot of friends who are um, coming out of the PhD program at Columbia and are, are a little disappointed in what they see, somewhat like I was disappointed. However, the flip side is is that if you have, if you know, 
I, I should also point out that graduate school has professionalized since I went, so you have to be uh, competitive, although I don't think a lot of, there are a lot of people out there taking Latin and Greek and wanting to go to PhD programs. They don't get as many applications. Our English department gets 900. Our classics department gets like 38 or something like that. So it's a, it, it's a different kettle of fish. But people who do get PhDs in classics, uh, if they do not get jobs, I mean, I don't think anybody in my co cohort ended up staying in academia. Some of them went on to do very interesting things. One of them is an author. Um, others are, um, I'm trying to, uh, trying to think of, uh, where else they are. A lot of them go into administration, I have to say. There's just something about classics. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's, you know, uh, Roman Egypt or what, but, uh, that's what it seems to be. Okay. So, I, I wouldn't say it's a waste of time. Okay. There was a question down here. Yeah. Right here. Um, so you mentioned um, the importance of taking a couple of year off, years off um, after the undergraduate degree um, before going to graduate school, and um, I'm I'm wondering um, what uh, you think is um, what are good opportunities to um, continue your studies in that time. Um, become a more competitive candidate and um, spend those gap years well? So I should say I didn't do that, first of all. So I, I went straight. This is just basically looking at kind of a comparative evidence of other people who were in grad school with me. And now some of them who came straight from college did great and you know, are doing wonderfully. The ones who, who, came, who spent a couple years or more off did all kinds of things. Some just got normal jobs and it was it showed commitment for them to come back to academia after they were making perfectly solid salaries as a teacher or whatever. Others went to business; they were consultants. Uh, quite a few did things that, for, again, this is very specific to political science, but like they went to Washington, they worked for a senator or something like that. Others would go to the Peace Corps or work overseas teaching English. So there's a whole array of things to do. Ideally, it matches up in some loose way with your interests, though that's much easier said than done. But it doesn't necessarily need to be exactly on your particular area. I just know that a lot of academics think that it shows more commitment to come back after you've been out of the real world, which suggests that you're more likely to kind of make it through the program um, rather than people who just think of it as an extension of college. Yeah, so. I, I can say that in terms of uh, history, kind of cultural studies more generally, I think this is probably true in, um, for anthropology and for, uh, for some areas of the humanities. Uh, we, have, we see a lot of students from the college now applying for post back fellowships for Ful Fulbrights. Uh, we, uh, I'm, I'm rather proud of the fact that in the last 15 years, the uh, number of students now graduating with Fulbrights have go has gone up astronomically. I think last year we had 21 seniors get Fulbrights. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities out there where you can actually, uh, and, and I think the reason students do that is to, is to and learn more of the local language. If you're in an area specific field like uh, Paul or I am, South Asia or Europe, uh, one way of, of using this gap year is to is to enrich your foreign language. Even if you're uh, being an au pair girl or or au pair boy, uh, or you know some other thing uh, in Berlin or in New Delhi or whatever, you're learning the language, and actually that does play in quite significantly in terms of the way people will think about what you've done. Uh, so uh, do consider those opportunities. Well, and there are a lot of them, and if you want to know more about them, come and see me or come and see Deb because they're. There are huge numbers of, uh, of these teaching opportunities, teaching a local gymnasium or at least say, they'll give you some money to live, but the actual, uh, uh, if, if it does figure rather Im importantly in terms of the graduate application. Probably have time for one more question. Okay, right there. Hi, I'm a fourth year and I just, my name is Omaris and I just finished applying to graduate programs. So I'm kind of like nervous about what that experience is gonna be like. And one of the things that you mentioned, Margaret, um, with your experience um, is the faculty relationships within the department. And that's one of the things that I worry about is just how much um, faculty relationships within the department, when they're not going so smoothly, how much that affects your experience as a grad student, the mentorship that you're going to be able to get. <laughs> okay. I, I was I was at a somewhat turbulent department, strangely, even though it's a very small classics department. People weren't getting along. And, you know, one can uh, get into the crossfire, but you can look at it in a positive way in that if you can navigate through this, I, I, by the end of my graduate career, I kind of felt like I'd become 
a pretty good double agent. And it's, it's kind of served me well. Some of the <laughs> skills of diplomacy I learned. Um, and I would ask everybody for advice, and uh, I would hear that people weren't happy that I talked to this person or that person. But I always talked to everybody and tried to get along with everybody, regardless of what was going on. I wouldn't let that, uh, I wouldn't let that scare you off because there are a lot of contexts where people don't get along, and it's not just <laughs> academia, you know. So. The, um, uh, there is, of course, the line that Kissinger once, I think it was Kissinger once said that the, 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 the politics and economy are so intense because the, what, what's at stake is so little. But, yes. uh, but, um, but that's not true, of course. Um, uh, okay, I, I, I want to thank our, our student organizers uh, and, uh, and I want to thank my panelists. I also want to, again, r remind you that um, we have Deb Nibel and we have our new program in higher ed and there's also uh, a lot of faculty like me who would like to help you. If, if we can do anything to help you advance your application process or think about it more clearly, please please avail yourselves of because you have a huge number of expert witnesses that who want to help you. So th let's give a round of applause for our, our panel.